All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third of four webinars presented by Integral Consulting's engineering practice. Uh, these webinars are highlighting some of the diverse challenges that, that we face on our projects and the approaches that we're using to solve them. Uh, keep an uh, eye out for an invitation to our final talk, um, which, as you see here, will be on February 28th. And we'll cover the changing regulatory environment of PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. Um, my name is James Lesperance. I'm an engineer at Integral, and I'll be moderating today's talk. Uh, a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, all attendees have been muted. Um, if you have questions during the talk, please ask them. Uh, and to do so, use the Q&A dialog box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you can type a question in there. We'll have time at the end and, and hoping to have a good discussion. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and after the talk, you'll receive an email with a link to the slides and also to a recording of the webinar. Contact information for the speakers is provided on the next slide, but also in the webinar invite. Um, please reach out to them if you have any follow-up questions. So with that, uh, I'll introduce today's speakers, who are Ben Leonard, Mark Schroeder, and Andrew Helmstad. Ben Leonard is an environmental scientist who focuses on data analysis, habitat assessments, and biological monitoring. He's worked on projects with the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and is currently pursuing his Ph.D. at Washington State. Mark Schroeder is an engineering training with a focus on fate and transport of contaminants in various media, including stormwater, and is an active participant in ITRC's Tire anti degradants anti-degradants team. That word gets me every time. Uh, and he'll be talking about that today. Uh, Andrew Helmstead is a licensed environmental engineer with over 11 years of diverse consulting experience, primarily focusing on the remediation of contaminated stormwater, sediments, and groundwater. And before I hand it over to our esteemed speakers, um, I want to take a moment to introduce what we're talking about today. Uh, which is emerging contaminants, uh, specifically within stormwater. Um, now, when we're talking about um, emerging contaminants, um, certainly can be a challenge on our sites, um, given evolving regulatory climates, newly published and maybe sometimes conflicting toxicological data, novel sampling techniques, um, experimental remediation technologies. Um, sometimes it feels like as soon as we come up with a plan, a new regulation is issued, or a new study is released and, and that changes the course once again or makes it feel like we need to start over. Um, within media, within the media of, of stormwater specifically, it can feel like these challenges are ratcheted up to a whole new level. Unlike groundwater or maybe subsurface soil, stormwater seems to be more immediately integrated into our communities and therefore more easily identifiable and understood by the general public. From a remediation stand, um, standpoint, stormwater isn't as predictable as other media, so treatment that may already be a challenge in normal circumstances um, becomes seemingly impossible. And, and finally, stormwater regulations for emerging contaminants tend to follow behind other media, so of, often we're left navigating difficult gray areas on how new regulations apply, uh, what concentrations are applicable in order for us to move forward and set goals. Um, do we use surface water standards, groundwater standards? It's not always clear on how to proceed. So we're certainly not going to solve all these issues or answer all these questions today, but we want to spend the next 45 minutes or so highlighting the current state of affairs within stormwater for two specific emerging contaminants, that being 6-PPD quinone and PFAS. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Ben to get us started. Uh, take it away, Ben. Great, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. So uh, I'm gonna kind of go over the presentation outline for today. Uh, I'm going to cover kind of the background uh, and toxicity of 6-PPD, um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Mark to cover fate transport solutions and regulations. So to start with uh, background on the compound and kind of why we care and kind of the story behind this discovery. I want to introduce like the whole issue surrounding, I guess, stormwater and what leads to uh, the discovery of some emerging contaminants, um, in particular, like with respect to sensitive aquatic species. So 
traditional gray stormwater infrastructure has really been historically designed to quickly divert water away from urban areas and primarily to prevent flooding. However, this really overlooks the needs of sensitive aquatic species living in and around urban drainages. The terminology and conceptual framework for understanding these impacts is known as urban stream syndrome, which was formally introduced and discussed in the scientific literature starting in the early 2000s. This syndrome encapsulates a series of ecological changes and degradations observed in streams and rivers as they traverse urbanized landscapes. Key among these are altered hydrology, habitat destruction, and for our purposes today, increased pollutant levels, which most adversely impact sensitive species such as salmon. So salmonids play a crucial role in riparian environments. They act as a vital link in transferring nutrients from the ocean to freshwater ecosystems. Their migration and subsequent spawning introduces marine derived nutrients into river systems, supporting a diverse array of species and bolstering the productivity and health of riparian habitats. They're also very charismatic creatures that can easily be observed in local creeks during spawning as shown in the photo from the, the right-hand side of the slide. So for spawning salmonids, urban stream syndrome brings several challenges, notably in hydrology and pollution. Increased runoff and altered flow regimes leads to the scouring of reds, severely impacting the survival rates of salmon eggs and um, really lowering the chance that the next generation can survive in the same stream. Additionally, there are impacts with thermal pollution from lack of riparian shading, which may increase water temperatures beyond what salmonids can tolerate. A uh, thing called pre-spawn mortality syndrome um, in coho salmon was initially associated with a, these broader set of issues surrounding urban stream syndrome in the Pacific Northwest. As first described by Schulz et al. 2011, Unexpected results were observed during several Seattle area stream restoration project monitoring surveys, where returning adult coho salmon exhibited abnormal behaviors and high mortality rates with significant egg retention in the female carcasses, meaning that they died before they were able to spawn. This phenomenon gained significant public attention due in part to the disturbing behavior exhibited by these salmon before death, in which they lose equilibrium while gaping for air at the surface. Systematic surveys conducted from 2002 to 2009 pointed to urban runoff as the likely cause of these die-offs, suggesting that coho salmon are particularly sensitive to a certain toxic contaminant or contaminants prevalent in urban areas. Given an apparent correlation with vehicular traffic, um, pre-spawn mortality became known as urban runoff mortality syndrome, or URMS, and vehicular traffic um, really became a focal point where contaminants associated with automobiles um, became a research area. Now here is a quick video showing some of these observed impacts um, where the salmon is gaping for air, losing equilibrium and dying all before the salmon can spawn. Uh, this was observed in Longfellow Creek, which is uh, near the Seattle area. As suggested by the last slide, um, this research really presented a critical need for redesigning our infrastructure to filter and treat stormwater to remove pollutants before they enter our rivers and streams. Therefore, before a specific contaminant was identified as responsible for URMS, studies were conducted to investigate whether toxicity could be observed by exposing salmon to stormwater and in turn nullified by treating stormwater. Studies conducted by McIntyre et al. found that the symptoms of URMS could be induced in a laboratory setting using urban stormwater runoff collected from a site with heavy vehicular traffic. They found um, that treating the stormwater using a bioretention mix was also able to reduce or eliminate the effluent toxicity. Following up on this line of inquiry, a series of tests were conducted using automobile-related contaminants. Using a mixture of nine unique tires, a leachate was created from simulated tire wear particles. A variety of aquatic organisms were then exposed to this leachate in addition to coho salmon, which included chum, and they are not necessarily known to exhibit URMS. Results 
from these experiments showed that tire wear particle leachate was able to reproduce the symptoms of URMS and coho and no other species, suggesting that an ingredient in tires may be responsible. Given that tire wear particles were associated with URMS, the specific compound present in tires became a research focus. A chemical forensics technique known as quantitative time of flight mass spectrometry was employed by Ed Kloge and his team at UW Tacoma to narrow down the list of potentially responsible contaminants. So this video right here shows the multi-step process in which these compounds were filtered, exposed to fish, combining both chemistry and toxicology, and eventually identifying a single compound. So by combining um, the chemistry technique with toxicology, this series of tests um, was able to isolate various features in the tire wear particle leachate. Um, chemical mixtures showing toxicity were further refined, and eventually a single chemical known as 6-PPD quinone was found likely responsible for URMS. Research has shown that 6-PPDQ is highly toxic to coho salmon, leading to acute mortality. The toxicity of 6-PPDQ is linked to its ability to cause oxidative stress and cell cellular damage in salmon, a problem that is not as nearly pronounced with the parent compound. 6-PPD is shown in the lower right image. Further research looked at coho salmon embryos exposed to 6-PPDQ from the IDE stage um, while they're developing until hatching and showed inhibited growth, but not acute mortality at concentrations lethal to older salmon. However, upon hatching, these young salmon exhibited heightened sensitivity to 6-PPD quinone, leading to mortality and indicating a critical period of vulnerability extending to multiplication. Molecular analysis suggested that the chemical may impair the blood-brain barrier, aligning with observed accumulations of macromolecules in the brains of exposed salmon. This blood vessel permeability may also extend to other vascular systems, presenting a complex suite of oxidative stress-related toxicity pathways. 6-PPDQ can induce oxidative stress by generating reactive oxygen species, or ROS, and overwhelming the antioxidant defense mechanisms of the fish. Oxidative stress can damage cellular components, including lipids, proteins, and DNA, has been implicated in the blood-brain barrier disruption. The acute susceptibility of coho, in particular, is still currently being researched. Several other fish species experience some level of toxicity. However, genetic factors explaining this difference has not been fully explored yet. It should be noted that coho, in particular, face a long upstream journey compared to other species, and that species-specific adaptations to accommodate this journey may play some role. Now, what is 6-PVD? And why is it even used in the first place? Since the 1960s, 6-PPD has played an indispensable role in the manufacturing of tires, fulfilling several critical functions for vital vehicle safety and performance. This chemical compound enhances tire grip, improves performance under wet conditions, reduces road noise, manages heat, optimizes rolling resistance, and ensures compliance with rigorous safety standards. The underlying mechanism of 6-PPD's action is its role as an anti-degradant. It reacts with ozone in the atmosphere, acting as a protective barrier that prevents the rubber from deteriorating. This reaction with ozone is not just a one-time event, however. 6-PPD is engineered to have a blooming effect. This unique characteristic allows it to continually migrate to the tire's surface over time, ensuring sustained protection against environmental factors that can compromise the tire's integrity, and by extension, vehicular safety. This ongoing surfacing of 6-PPD is critical, but it also contributes to its presence in the environment, where it can transform into toxic byproducts affecting aquatic life, as seen in the case of coho salmon. Now, there are quite a few knowledge gaps in toxicity. So when we discuss the impact of toxic substances, it is imperative to consider the breadth of effects beyond just acute mortality, which we've covered. The question arises, does the toxicity extend to subtler yet equally devastating long-term health impacts? Furthermore, it compels us to explore whether exposure to such chem chemicals makes salmon or indeed any aquatic organisms more susceptible to additional environmental stressors. 
this complex interplay of chemical toxicity and environmental stress opens up a critical area of concern for the health of aquatic ecosystems. Outside of aquatic ecosystems, turning our focus to human exposure, recent studies have ventured into uncharted territories examining the presence of these chemicals in human populations. In a revealing investigation involving 150 urine samples from adults, children, and pregnant women, the findings were quite stark. Not only was 6-PPD quinone detected at levels higher than 6-PPD, uh, which suggests active metabolism in the human body, but notably pregnant women exhibited the highest concentration. This data not only underscores the pervasive nature of such contaminants, but also raises urgent questions about potential implications for the most vulnerable among us. And speaking of uh, vulnerable populations, in addressing uh, the critical issue of environmental just, uh, justice, it is important to recognize that communities living near high traffic roadways really bear the brunt of air pollution particularly from particulates emanating from tire wear and vehicular emissions. These communities are often comprised of disproportionately lower income families and people of color who face elevated risks to their health and well-being due to their proximity to pollution sources. This situation underscores a broader theme of environmental inequity where the burden of pollution is not borne equally across society. Equally significant is the profound connection between tribal nations and the Pacific Northwest and salmon. For these communities, salmon are not just merely a fish species, but they represent an integral part of their culture, history, and sustenance. The decline in salmon populations exacerbated by such pollutants as 6-PPD quinone poses a direct threat to tribal treaty rights. These rights enshrined in agreements federal government guarantee access to traditional foods and resources, including salmon, which are essential for the physical and cultural survival of these communities. In response to this crisis, the Pacific Northwest tribal nations are taking legal action against um, tire manufacturers and petitioning the US EPA to regulate 6PBD. Um, these steps are part of a broader effort to protect not only the salmon populations and the ecosystems they inhabit, but also to uphold the rights and traditions of the tribal nations. So now that I've covered the background on the issue, uh, Mark is going to go over uh, the bait and transport and get into uh, solutions and regulations. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so my name is Mark Schroeder. I'm an engineer at Integral, and I will talk a little bit of uh, how we can use the properties of 6 VBD to guide um, treatment methods. Um, so to start, um, we can look at this conceptual uh, model of how 6-PPD moves through the environment. Um, ben has touched largely upon um, how tire wear particles and 6-PPD Q moves through the aquatic ecosystem. But we also know that 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone move through other, move in partition between other media such as air, sediment, and soils. <clears throat> Um, the amount of 6-PPD that can move through water uh, and the environment uh, also depends on the particulate size, um, which is this range from microscopic to what's visible on roadways. Um, the more surface area, the more it can leach into the water and uh, get into the soil and sediments. Um, and where else does it um, partition? Um, and I'll and I'll talk about the properties of like how it partitions in these uh, in the environment. I think it's really important um, to have an understanding of how mobile it is in the environment, as well as how long it lasts. Um, six PBD and six PBD quinone both um, have a affinity to partition to organic matter, as measured by partitioning coefficients that are observed in lab experiments. Um, the the coefficients uh, are a measure of how these chemicals partition between water and organic matter or carbon, and also how it partitions between water and octanol, which is a representative uh, representation of um, lipids and fats and how it might be bioaccumulated in uh, wildlife. Um, so 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone are both uh, relatively low uh, 
have built have relatively low solubilities, um, which is partly why they so absorb to organic matter. Um, but this is still at levels and concentrations in urban environments that are acutely toxic to these salmon species. Um, the time that 6-PPD quinone persists in the environment is actually relatively short. Uh, for we see the most uh, acute effects of 6-PPD on salmon um, in early storms um, in the winter season in the Pacific Northwest, where storms will flush out uh, tire wear particles and 6-PPD quinone off of roadways and pulse it through the local streams, um, which also makes it really hard to measure. It means we have, you have to take continuous samples, and as the longer the uh, duration of the storm, the uh, lower the concentration it is towards the end. And in addition to that kind of initial pulse driving the toxic effects in streams, 6 PVD is also uh, predicted to have a relatively short half-life. Um, this is not um, observed in experiments yet. This is more of a like model thermodynamically, um, and that's currently being researched. So between these kind of these properties, these are what are going to be driving treatment solutions in the future. So if you bring it back to this conceptual model, um, here's a quick table that summarizes different observed concentrations, um, summarized uh, from a variety of literature. Um, as you can see in the roadway runoff and surface waters, the concentrations of 6-PPD quinone are just, higher, just high enough to be acutely toxic to those several species. We also see that um, it is measured in sediment, which is both um, confirmed and uh, also observed in some of those pre preliminary studies by Dr. McIntyre in 2015 that then described as how they isolated 6-PPD. So if we take these properties and then um, apply, um, kind of use these to guide solutions, I like to break it into near-term and long-term solutions. Um, <clears throat> near-term be being the most studied, uh, uh, near-term being the most studied at the moment. <laughs> Um, really being traditional BMPs uh, modified to uh, filter out the pollutant or conventional water treatment systems um, just to remove it from wastewater. Long-term solutions identified are how do we regulate the chemical in the future or design infrastructure that can uh, reduce the, the load of 6-PPD into the environment. The Department of Ecology in Washington has published a really great uh, effectiveness ratings document for traditional BMPs on what is the most effective um, for removing 6-PPD given these affinities to absorb to organic matter. So um, just to quickly summarize, the highest uh, treatment uh, effectiveness uh, BMPs are ones that can slow the water down and then filter it out. So I think this really becomes an engineering challenge to, uh, this can really be an uh, engineering challenge to just design BMPs to filter it out. The greatest challenge becomes how do you implement this at such a large scale? Um, as I was kind of showing, these are just a couple like quick and dirty examples of best management practices. Um, that could be modified to target 6-PVD specifically um, that already exist uh, in, in, the, in the stormwater infrastructure of uh, trapping the pollutant before it can get into different conveyance systems or into the neighboring streams. Um, we've seen several studies showing that compost amendments and adding bio, uh, organic matter into these uh, bioretention medias and filtration um, BMPs are pretty effective at removing 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone. So maybe, so I think this is one strategy that's just being really actively pursued is how do we modify existing, uh, how do we modify these existing uh, strategies? 
One case study that I think is really uh, important is Ohop Creek, which is located just south of Seattle in between Tacoma and the mountains. And the Nisqually Indian tribe has partnered with several other professional organizations to design a treatment uh, treatment system that collects stormwater off of several hundred feet of highway next to a watershed that um, has shown adverse effects with the coho salmon. And it collects the water through this, uh, this catchment and then it sends it to this treatment or uh, filtration unit, which is really just uh, a garbage bin that has uh, lots of organic matter, compost, and several other varieties of organic uh, kind of medias that can filter the water. And they found that it has demonstrated a large reduction in 6PP to So I think this is a really important example that of low cost systems that uh, can be targeted uh, in the most uh, necessary environments. There are a lot of challenges. Um, these are actively evolving. Um, there, I alluded to sampling challenges with how you collect the samples. As of last week, um, this uh, first bullet point is already out of date because the EPA has now released a draft lab standard of um, how we can uh, measure 6PPD quinone, and this should lower the cost substantially and make it much more accessible to measure the chemical um, in standard lab in standard water samples. <clears throat> we also know how these chemical properties can guide the behavior of the contaminant, but observed faint transport is still relatively uncertain. We don't know about how the contam contaminants can desorb from soil or sediments uh, once it might be captured. Um, given a short half-life, ideally, maybe it wouldn't uh, be an issue, but that's uh, still under investigation. <clears throat> and really, there's very limited case studies um, uh, right now. Like the, the OHOP Creek case study is one of the very, is the only one that is uh, publicly published right now. Um, I know the Department of Washington or Department of Ecology and some of the state organizations are studying uh, more case studies right now, but those aren't released yet. And finally, are there other sources of 6TPD? Um, the roadways are the most, uh, are the largest source, but we use recycled car tires in many other places like turf fields, uh, uh, landfills, marinas, and maybe these these might need to be other uh, considerations in the future of where we are finding this contaminant. And then I'm just going to quickly touch on the regulation structure in Washington. We in Washington we break it into we break permitting for stormwater into kind of two categories: one for point sources and one and another section for municipalities or non-point sources, which 6PPD quinone falls under. Um, in my involvement with ITRC and working with uh, working with the people at the Department of Ecology and seeing what they're doing, they're really considering how do we design the permit so that municipalities can uh, treat to the maximum extent practicable, not and not be prescribed an unreasonable um, treatment level that can't be met. Um, but in addition, this is also going to require a large variety of BMPs uh, to be implemented. There's no one solution for any specific area. And given the scale of this, this will take quite a lot of, <clears throat> uh, this will take a, a large uh, variety of uh, engineered treatments all over um, roadways and near creeks. In California, the Department of Toxic Substances Control has already begun regulating 6PPD through the Consumer uh, Products Program. This is going to require tire manufacturing companies or the chemical producers to identify alternative chemicals and state an intent that they will remove 6PPD from their tires. Washington is pursuing a similar bill that's um, being discussed in the Senate right now, um, which will 
uh, do relative do almost this do a very similar thing in Washington. And as Ben mentioned, also um, the tr several tribal nations have petitioned the EPA to regulate 6PPD under the Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, which that and that petition was accepted. So in the next uh, coming year, we'll probably see quite a bit more details come out and how, how this will be done. <clears throat> Though all of this wouldn't be possible without my uh, involvement at the I, in ITRC, um, just working with a large range of experts in all fields. Um, I just want to point out that we have a focus sheet that's now available for more information at a somewhat high level that gives lots of information and sources and um, takeaways. But we're also and we're also soon to be publishing a, a very in-depth web-based guidance document, which is written for policymakers or stakeholders. <clears throat> These are just a handful of links because I know it gets a lot of attention on the West Coast, but it's also being uh, very, it's getting a lot of attention in the Great Lakes region, um, areas where the fishing industries are prominent. Um, so it's not just in the West Coast, um, it's, getting, it's uh, pretty, it's being considered by a lot of other municipalities. So just in summary for this, uh, talk Ben discussed the toxicology and how there's a lot of there's still data gaps on how toxic it is to humans, um, and these are things that are all actively being uh, studied right now. And it's lots of information is coming up every every year and down to the months. Um, as far as solutions go, we can uh, we can use our understanding of the chemical properties to guide near term solutions, and long term solutions kind of also. Uh, cover an umbrella of regulation and how we're going to control 6PPD. Um, and finally, just looking ahead, I think we can also learn from other emerging contaminants on what we might expect with 6PPD in the future. I think the topic of PFAS is, has some parallels of how do we find replacements that are adequate for what we use in car tires or um, in industry, but also are not toxic. And <clears throat> with that, I will pass it over to Andrew. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Uh, my name is Andrew Holmstead, and I'll be switching gears slightly, uh, still talking about stormwater, but focusing on PFAS, um, specifically regulation, management, and treatment. So um, this presentation will not get into the very muddy history and background on the per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Uh, on the slide here, I've list, put up just a family tree. Um, folks that are aware of PFAS in general know that it's a very large class, over 4,000 very diverse and distinct chemicals, very complex nomenclature and chemistries associated with this class of chemicals. Um, but really, I'll point out on a future slide, there's a much smaller set of PFAS compounds that have an environmental and regulatory relevance um, that at least helps to start to narrow down the focus area and the, the questions that we have to answer with respect to PFAS evaluation and stormwater. Um, before going into regulation, uh, first a, a primer on different uses and chemical properties. So we all know at this point, PFAS are widely used, anything from nonstick coatings, medical and trans technical innovations, flame retardants, food storage. These chemicals are both heat resistant and stain resistant, um, which makes them very useful for everyday products. The chemical properties of these compounds are widely researched and widely understood, and important features are listed on the slide here. With respect to water treatment and stormwater treatment, chemical class has some similarities with other chemical classes that have been a focus of stormwater for decades, uh, in particular the focus on treatment and research and evaluation at given sites. However, there are a few key properties that separate this chemical class from others like PCBs, solids, metals, and, and general other chemicals that are present in stormwater. PFAS chemicals are highly water soluble, unlike PCBs, 
they are resistant to biodegradation, unlike VOCs and certain PAHs. They have a low volatility. Um, and these features are key to approaching stormwater evaluation and treatment. Before getting to that step, what are the current regulations? So this is foreshadowing the next talk uh, that James mentioned at the top of this hour. Uh, but Integral has done a has put forth a really unique and advantageous collection of PFAS proposed regulations and advisories. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of this slide, uh, broken down by individual media, so drinking water, groundwater, surface water, fish tissue, soil contact, and soil leaching. At this point, PFAS regulations are largely driven by uh, state individual state enforcement or state regulations. Uh, with respect to drinking water, EPA has proposed MCLs for a small subset or about six uh, classes or six groups of PFAS chemicals. When we start to look at surface water and stormwater, it's a much smaller set of regulations that are in place. Uh, so with respect to stormwater, currently there are five states with enforceable surface water regulations covering PFAS compounds. Two states have non-enforceable surface water regulations and one state has proposed regulations in tow. So definitely encourage folks to take advantage of this resource. The link on the slide is constantly updated and with the ever evolving regulatory environment, the first stop in understanding stormwater treatment before approaching stormwater treatment is to understand what regulations are in place that govern those discharge and govern permits. Factors that drive treatment costs. So similar to other stormwater uh, type, other stormwater evaluations, starting with the question of you know, what treatment will work at a given site. Things to consider are coming PFAS concentrations. There's a wide variety and again, quickly evolving set of laboratory uh, analysis and laboratory methods that cover PFAS generally in potable water systems, uh, but are uh, used for evaluating and identifying PFAS compounds in stormwater. As with any other type of stormwater treatment, um, cost consideration, the amount of water requiring treatment is a huge consideration. So the focus should be similar to other types of chemicals and other types of chemical approaches. Start with a good and comprehensive conceptual site model for your site. Know what the history of the site involved, know what current chemicals or what current practices are in place at a site. The extent to which you can use that CSM to identify areas of a site or smaller areas of site or focus down on rather than wanting to explore overall treatment, looking at the specific areas that may have historically had PFAS compounds in greater concentration or, particular, or in use is key to consider before moving forward. Um, with PFAS treatment, the occurrence and concentrations of other compounds is key. As we talk about in the next slide, treatment measures that have been successful at the bench scale do require um, you know, essentially a polishing step or a pre-polishing step to reduce loads of particularly solids uh, and other compounds before treating for PFAS itself. Um, given that there are so many different types of PFAS compounds, the absorption characteristics or chemical and physical physical properties that are relevant for the PFAS compounds that may be going on at a current site are key to understand uh, before moving into trying to implement a active treatment system or even passive treatment systems at a site. And again, given that currently there are limited regulations that are really focused on PFAS chemicals, the treatment standards and treatment technology performance with respect to PFAS treatment and stormwater is you know, what I'd say is still in its infancy. There are goals, there are uh, approved methods for evaluating before and after uh, for treatment systems, uh, but really without a firm regulation in place, understanding what is allowed or what could be you know, considered a, an allowed discharge from the site uh, is still something that remains to be seen. 
bait and transport considerations, again, looking at your site and thinking about, you know, where is the worthwhile starting point for PFAS evaluations in stormwater? Again, starting with due diligence and developing a conceptual site model for your individual site to help narrow down what potential you know, specific types of PFAS chemicals were present or may be present because the properties of those PFAS chemicals can vary and change based on the carbon chain length. Uh, the ab absorption of these compounds generally increases with chain link, meaning some PFAS forms were more absorptive. So because the properties depend on the types of chemicals present, due diligence is always a good starting point. And this is true for not only PFAS chemicals, but was the same for uh, things like VOCs or PCBs historically in stormwater. Um, again, behavior can be and generally is site specific with respect to stormwater. Uh, so understanding where on site different processes might have used PFAS chemicals is a key starting point. Now, when we start to talk about treatment considerations, given the lack of uh, you know, clarity with respect to regulations, a good starting point is always to you know, think back to the Clean Water Act language which mentions best available technology economically achievable and the requirement to implement treatment for stormwater to the maximum extent practicable. So without current regulations in NPDES permits or with given sites, uh, again, there is allowance for you know, econ economical aspects of treatment. Uh, and again, the maximum extent practical is still something that's evolving with respect to individual treatment measures and different vendors and different uh, methods for treatment advertise different removal capabilities. Given that traditional stormwater BMPs at sites are typically passive, uh, and with these traditional BMPs for other chemicals, there's a database of effectiveness. Uh, again, the question of what type of passive, or are there even passive systems that might work for a site with respect to PFAS is generally not something that current literature is able to answer in terms of the starting for a question of you know, where, where should a site start. Um, but promising side, there are bench scale studies where passive treatment for PFAS removal have been shown to be effective. Looking at different treatment technologies, um, kind of just a, a little bit of a word cloud up on the site or up on the slide with respect to different technologies primarily focused on potable water systems, but this is not a comprehensive list. However, the blue or purple technologies have shown promising results, but also some limitations. Uh, they're not full scale, you know, economically achievable approaches with uh, most of these treatment technologies for PFAS, uh, but there are promising bench scale results. Uh, a lot of these results, as I mentioned before, do require some polishing or removal of solids or other compounds before really focusing on removal of PFAS chemicals. Some of these technologies may only treat specific PFAS species. So again, knowing what's coming off of your site and knowing uh, the different compounds that may have been present based on historical operations is always worthwhile. And these treatment technologies, again, are very sensitive to the influent profiles. And what I mean by that is the other chemicals and other materials that may be coming into, coming off of a site beyond just PFAS chemicals and stormwater. Uh, again, there is no end all be all at this point treatment technology. So uh, again, it's all about due diligence and knowing before going with or before advancing on a specific treatment technology uh, to try to avoid those technologies that might claim to be the, the end all be all, or if you will, the, the pixie dust delivery service. Since there are limited um, full scale results with respect to stormwater treatment of PFAS chemicals, it is advantageous to look to other media, uh, specifically viable potable water treatment systems have been demonstrated to be effective, very effective in some cases at removal of PFAS chemicals. I've listed just three on the screen, granular activated carbon, ion exchange resin, membrane filtration. Uh, these potable water systems can treat a variety of, of short and long chain PFAS chemicals. Uh, each individual treatment technology is proven at the full scale, but really depends on the chain length and site specifics or PFAS compound specifics given present in the water supply, the water source. Uh, 
Um, for several of these technologies, including ion exchange, there are PFAS specific ion exchange resin blends that have been developed that are uh, capable of treating specific PFAS chemicals or specific compounds. Um, the overall you know, future of these technologies is promising, but with respect to stormwater treatment, um, I wouldn't at this point stand here and say that any of these is economically um, advantageous or particularly effective for large scale treatment of stormwater. Um, but as these technologies continue to evolve, there is a lot of promise. Finally, a couple of guidance and links. Um, as, as Mark and Ben mentioned before, ITRC has an outstanding primer on PFAS chemicals and compounds, like about background regulation status, technologies and case studies. Uh, and again, another pitch for integrals regulatory status tracker online. It offers a state by state and media specific tracking of ongoing proposed regulations. And as these regulations evolve, that tracking will be key to understanding regulations that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, and that regulation of PFAS topic is going to be the heart of our next talk. Um, but before that, I think we will now pause and open it up to any questions and I'll turn it back over to James. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I did. So, so yeah, folks, uh, if you have any questions, um, we've got some time here. So um, um, use that Q&A dialog box down at the bottom. Feel free to type something in. Um, I did put a link to that PFAS regulatory tracker map down in the resources tab down on the bottom. Uh, if you look at the resources tab, you can you can access a link to that map that we keep up to date. Um, and I did also um, put a link to the ITRC uh, 6 PPDQ focus sheet that Mark mentioned um, as an answer to a question from Holly. So Holly, thanks for asking that. Um, all right, this question, let's see, see if we've got some, some things coming in. Philip Bender um, enjoyed the um PFAS delivery pixie death delivery service uh comment Andrew unfortunately I don't think us at integral are offering that quite yet so hopefully um we can develop that technology soon um Philip does have another question Andrew that that maybe you can take a stab at which is um if we have a sense of the types of large-scale PFAS stormwater sources um, ones that would be worthy of treatment per se, maybe maybe more point sources than than surface flow or or, or that sort of thing. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, Phil, is you know if we look at the regulatory environment uh, as driving what types of compounds or classes of PFAS should be treated or prioritized, um, you know I think from a regulatory perspective, starting with those compounds that are you know, right now uh, being proposed for MCLs at the drinking water stage. So there's about six you know, sets or compounds of, of PFAS that I think James off the top of his head probably knows, but those chemical classes would be the logical starting point for looking at, you know, what would be uh, maybe some of the more stringent or more um, specific compounds to start to look for and start to screen for initially at a site. Uh, and again, since those six compounds or classes um, do have proposed MCLs, there is abundant research from, from vendors and, and technologies and treatments and case studies uh, that does shed some light on the efficiency and the removal uh, effectiveness and potential with different treatment measures. So hopefully that answers the question, Phil. Yeah, I think what I'd add to that is that given what Andrew's saying about passive versus active treatment within stormwater and the, the maximally extent practicable uh, threshold for treatment that I think what we're generally seeing is more active treatment for stormwater for PFAS right now, which which means more industrial sources, um, industrial sort, you know, point sources under state or federal um, discharge permits, that sort of thing at this point. Um, I'm going to switch gears, um, and and there's a six PPD question that Ben, um, I think you could you could answer um, from Linda asking, uh, can you explain what it means that six PPD 
may be metabolized metabolized in humans. Uh, referring to the slide that shows, I, mean, I think it's referring to the slide that had the the six PPDQ and six PPD um, concentrations from some of the initial studies um, at at human uptake that have been done. Certainly. So uh, maybe just to really quickly cover the actual paper that I was citing there. This is a do it all 2022, so pretty new study. It's in uh, ESNT letters, so it's um, you know in a journal, but it's pretty to the point as far as the results. And you know, there's some speculation, but it doesn't you know fully get into you know all the different pathways um, that could lead to metabolism. Um, it should be noted that six PPD and its transformation product six uh, PPD Q. Uh, were frequently detected in human urine across different populations in South China, including adult children and pregnant women. Those are like the three study groups. And 6PPDQ in particular was found in all urine samples from adults and pregnant women with its concentration significantly higher than those of 6PPD. Um, and so the evidence for metabolism refers to some in vitro experiments using human liver microsomes which simulated the human lovers' um, metabolic processes in these experiments. A significant portion, about 65% of 6PPD, was metabolized after three hours of incubation, suggesting that 6PPD undergoes some metabolic transformations in the human body. Um, however, the transformation rate was actually somewhat low um, when comparing 6PPDQ to 6PPD and didn't explain the you know, full difference between the concentrations of those compounds in the human urine. Um, to me, that suggests that the actual exposure pathways um, may vary in terms of the concentration, the ratio of um, the exposure of 6PPD and 6PPDQ um, for the you know populations being studied. So I hope that uh, gets at answering that question. It's you know definitely complicated. There's evidence to show that 6PPD is metabolized, and there may be other unspecified uh, metabolites in humans. But 6PPDQ was specifically being looked at because of um, the acute mortality syndrome observed in coho salmon. But there's no evidence that there is you know uh, toxicity. Um, in, in humans, um, just that the compound is present in human urine. Thanks, Ben. Um, Mark, I've got a question for you. I'm going to wrap up maybe two similar questions into one here, since I think this is a good point being made. And that's for, for treatment of 6PPDQ and kind of what, what the next steps are. Given that um, you, you you know you mentioned that 6PBU impacted runoff is largely originating from non-point sources. Um, have states or municipalities started looking at implementing BMPs to address that, or or have they they been taking any action at this point, or or have you seen any kind of rumblings of what the plans might be there? Uh, <clears throat> right now, everything is wrapped into those stormwater permitting uh, MS4 permits. So at, at, as far as people taking action, no. Um, right now, I think they're trying to decide how they can actually permit uh, concentrations and what, what the municipalities will have to have to do. So the quick and quick answer is no. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. <laughs> Um, let's see, um, I'm loving all these questions. Um, I see a couple questions on degradation, which I could just quickly touch on. Um, yeah. Uh, from what I've seen, so for 6PPD, the parent, uh, chemical that's in tires, that's very oxid, that that's very reactive and its point is to react with oxygen. So that one as expected has a very short half-life. Um, on the matter of really hours. Um, from just a quick uh, search, I know California Department of Toxic Substances Control has some uh, publicized uh, information on half-lives and for 6PPD quinone. Um, it, it takes a little bit longer, but it's still on the matter of days. Um, 
which I think makes sense. And then there's a variety of other uh, research and academic articles that kind of contest that or show it's uh, shorter or longer. So, thanks. And to add to that, um, there's a difference in half lives reported at um, different water temperatures. Um, and so, again, just from like a quick search, uh, at 33 hours, uh, 33 hours for 23 degrees Celsius um, is, you know, one study that um, is referenced, but there's, you know, a lot of variety. I think that Mark was spot on with just, you know, it's in the hours, not days. Great. Um, while we're talking six PPDQ, Ethan has a question um, about about the measurement process for six PBDQ in the environment. Um, can a simple water uh, sample be collected or is there more to need to quantify? And that actually, that's as Mark referenced, EPA released a draft method for six PBDQ yesterday, I think. Um, I, I swear we didn't plan this. We didn't call up EPA and say, hey, we're having a talk on six PBDQ. Can you release your draft guidance on the method the day before our talk? Because that'd be great. Or maybe we did. I don't know. I don't think we have that power. But I'll I'll put a link to that draft method uh, in the Q and A answers as well, just so folks can check that out. Um. All right. I think we have time for like one more question. I think I'll do a PFAS one. Um, I really appreciate everybody being this engaged. This is awesome. Um, Cheryl asks. Um, how many wastewater treatment facilities are currently using filtration systems for PFAS compounds? Um, I can answer this one, Andrew, unless you may go for it. Uh, kick it to you, James. Uh, I could speak more to the waste or sorry, potable water supply systems, but for wastewater treatment, um, you have an answer, go for it. Yeah, well, traditionally wastewater treatment plants, the, the traditional treatment on wastewater treatment plants do not treat for PFAS. So that's the, when you're when you're looking at your your average average run of the mill wastewater treatment plant. There's likely not PFAS treatment, um, and there's even complicating factors with traditional wastewater treatment where you you could be concentrating the PFAS in sludge, and then that sludge may be being spread on farms nearby, and that's creating a secondary source and things like that. Um, so yeah, that is a challenge. Um, however uh there are it's, it's becoming more common that wastewater treatment plants are treating for pfas um but it's still uh, certainly not the majority of them all right so i think we're about at our time um i think there's a few questions that we didn't get to um but the speakers will get to those and and reach out to folks as um as applicable to, to try to get answers to everybody's questions. Like I said, I really appreciate everybody's engagement um, and, and seeming passion around these topics, um, which certainly makes sense. Uh, this is certainly top of mind for a lot of us and, and new and, and exciting and, and, and all that. So um, really appreciate everybody joining in. Thanks again to the speakers. Um, again, if you have any other follow-up questions, definitely reach out to them. They'd be happy to to chat all things PFAS and, and 6PPDQ and, and hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.